a video feed. Uh, so go ahead and give me a smiley face if I'm coming through for all of you. Can you all see me? We getting some smiley faces in there? Yes, we are. Awesome. All right, perfect. So hello, everyone. Um, I am absolutely thrilled to be here to have a chat with you today about uh, finances, how to improve your finances, uh, give you some steps, some strategies to create better options for your families. Now, before I get going, uh, I would just love to know where you're listening from. And I, I see on the list that there's a good friend in Washington. So uh, a special hello to her. She's actually the reason that I'm here today. She connected me with your military family. So thank you very much for that. Um, but go ahead and type in the chat box where you're coming from. And I'll just let you know while you're doing that, uh, that I'm coming to you from Ottawa. And everybody says it's a great day here today. It's about minus one. Uh, but four and a half, five days ago, I was in Australia where it was plus 27. So I'm still in a little bit of shock about the weather. Uh, but uh, from all outward appearances, it seems to be like a reasonable day. So I heard somebody uh, chime in earlier from Oklahoma. So uh, what else have we got here? Uh, let's just see. I'm just going to pop open the chat feature uh, on there. Oh, awesome. So we've got saint jean sur richelieu we Italy. Oh, that's fantastic. Calgary, Victoria, Borden, Virginia, Oklahoma City, Belle Oeil, uh, just south of Montreal. That's fantastic. So uh, hello, everyone, uh, and welcome. And thank you very much for taking the time to be here today. So January, everybody always starts about talking about money in January. I have a special reason for doing so. So before I dive right in, I just want to tell you a couple of things. Uh, so first thing, my goal today for you, uh, if you remember nothing else about this presentation, I want you to take something away and it's this. My goal for people and women in particular, and I see that our group is largely, if not entirely women here, um, is for you to start thinking about money and finances deliberately. Um, for you to start making conscious financial choices and not the game changer when that happens. And this, this motive, this goal, is going to recur throughout all of the five steps that I talk about today. It is that important. So bear that in mind that with everything that I share today, what I'm trying to do is to bring up to a level of consciousness the choices that we're making in life. So give me a, uh, a green check if that, sounds, if that sounds plausible, if that sounds doable for you. Are we all good on that? Awesome, okay, great. Um, so, I am going to start with step number one, which is establishing a healthy mindset and money patterns, but before I launch into that, why am I talking about money in the first place? So, where am I coming from with this? So, uh, a little bit of background about me. I was supposed to be a professor of neurolinguistics. If life had gone the way it was supposed to go, that's where I would be. I would be teaching, I would be talking to you about neurolinguistics, I would not be talking to you about money. But life has a funny way of throwing wrenches in the work sometimes, and I got a, a heck of a big one uh, in my early 30s. So I was on track, I had fully funded research, I was doing very well as an academic, um, and then my first husband's cancer came back, he had childhood cancer, and I walked away from my future uh, from my studies, from my research, to help him with his business and his health. Um, he died, we were together for nine and a half years, and he died when he was 31. And on top of that devastation, I realized at that time that I was left with $400,000 of debt. So I just want you to take a second to think about that number, $400,000. That's a staggering amount of debt. So go ahead, give me a green check mark if anybody on this list has, has ever experienced significant debt. Let's just see. So we've had a few people who have experienced that, so you know where I'm coming from with this. So the good news is I'll tell you right now that um, I paid off that debt in two years, and the business, by the way, was dead because it depended on him. So I had to figure out how am I going to pay off this debt and what is I'm going to do because my skills were no longer valid. I was nine years out of my research. I couldn't continue on with that. So that was a complete reset button on my life. It completely changed the course of my life. And at that time, what I did is I dedicated to figuring out, I dedicated myself to figuring out what just happened here. 
Um, how does a person who is highly educated, who's reasonably smart, go from being on track, go from having all of her goals met to finding herself $400,000 in debt, a widow at 32 and no future. So from that moment on, I have been researching money, every aspect of money, it has become central. I developed a business where I worked with people to help them get over and, and kind of reorganize through financial crises. I would put together plans for them, uh, walk them through major debt or bankruptcy or other uh, financial crises to a point of stability so that they could obtain a mortgage for a house and be in a better position. I did that for a decade and for the last two years, I've been focusing exclusively on creating curriculum and researching money uh, to teach financial foundations, financial literacy, um, and also uh, how to invest, which is a big thing. So that'll come up later. But because of what I do, a lot of people turn to me and they say, you know what, Doris, here's my situation. What would you do in my situation? So how, do, how would you solve this? How would you, you know, I've got this debt. How do I get out of this debt? Or I can't seem to save money. I can't seem to do this. And they're looking to me for tips and strategies. And I certainly do give that. But all the tips and strategies in the world will not matter one little bit if you don't start with number one, which is establish a healthy mindset and money patterns. You know, people always focus on the hard side of money, which is all of the actions, the debt repayment, the dealing with credit cards, et cetera. And very few people take the time to look at what I call the most powerful side of money, which is the soft side of money. And that has to do with your money patterns and your money beliefs. So here's what I want you to I want you to do. I want you to ask yourself some questions right now. And um, obviously, you're not going to answer these right this moment. You have the, the ability to come back and listen to this, but I strongly encourage you to take the time to do this work. Why? Because with all of the clients that I've worked with, I've noticed that the ones who are successful are the ones who figure out what are my money patterns? What is it that I'm bringing to the table in terms of beliefs about money? These guys, when they take the time to do that, they implement the strategies and the tips that I pass on, and then they have success. When they don't do that, they have the recurring pattern. So you can follow all the tips and strategies in the world, and you're probably going to find yourself right back in the same position unless something changes. So let me ask you a few questions. So what relationship did your parents have with money? And when I say relationship, I'm talking about was it something that was stressful for them? Was it just a tool and they were, you know, unemotional about it and said, yep, this is how you use it? Um, is it something that caused arguments in the family or was it just not a big deal? You kind of dealt with money. Those were the first set of questions because we have to look at how did we grow up? What was the environment like when we were growing up and what conversations were being had? in the house when we were growing up because we were picking that up. Then we ask ourselves, what language did they use? So give me a green check mark if your parents, if you ever heard this phrase, money doesn't grow on trees. Has anybody ever heard that? Pretty much everybody has heard or many people have heard that. So that's part of what I'm saying is the conversation when, when people are saying, you know, look, money is hard to come by, you know, uh, money doesn't grow on trees, or you got to be careful, or, you know, wealthy people are, are greedy. Those are the kinds of conversations, those, that's the kind of language that we look at and we say, what's behind that? Is that the language of scarcity or is that the language of abundance? And I have experienced my own family where it was very much about a scarcity mentality, and I grew up with that, and it took a significant impact. It took this this event in my in my 30s to figure out, holy smokes, let's just take a look at, at all of the assumptions that I brought to the table. When I made those changes, when I figured out what those was, that's when my life changed significantly. Ask yourself, what language do you use when it comes to money? How do you talk about money? What kind of words do you use? Because those will tell you a great deal about where you're coming from. So now I want you to start to identify the money pattern in your parents, uh, in, in your house when you were growing up that your parents had, good or bad. So maybe your parents were great savers. They always saved money and they taught you either unconsciously or deliberately to save money. That's a pattern. Uh, other patterns, I'll give you an example from my clients. So I have 
had two clients, one of them, uh, a gentleman who earned a significant amount of cash, six figures, high six figures, and he never had any money to save. He was unable to save. And when we started looking at what was going on, he was self-employed and money would come in big chunks, $20,000, $30,000 contracts, they'd get paid. Next thing you know, that money is gone. And when we started looking at what's going on with this, we realized that as soon as the money came in, he would buy stuff, he would give it away. And I asked him, I said, what's behind that? And it was for him a form of acceptance. That was the way that he validated himself as after he did the work. But he was unable to change that, that pattern. As far as I know, he's still in that pattern of making big money and having it disappear. I'll contrast that with another client who um, she, I worked with her. She had significant credit card debt. And so I put together some strategies and a plan for her to get out of that debt. And what I did is I said, okay, you got to follow these things. So she worked for two years to do that. She finally gets herself out of debt. And then I go to check her credit bureau and she's back in debt. So I call her up and we'll call her Debbie. I'll say, Debbie, what's going on? You spent so long getting out of credit card debt and she couldn't figure it out. So we sat down. She said, I don't know. I just had to do this. So she got another dog, uh, paid $600 for a dog. She already had a dog. And she said, well, you know, it's not that much more expensive for two dogs, which we all know is not the case. Um, and there were other things that she was buying. And so what I said is I said, let's take a look at this behavior. Where's this coming from? And after doing this work exactly, she figured out that her parents had never had any money ever. They always spent and off it went. She was replicating that pattern. And then she realized, I said, stop and think about what it would feel like to have money and no debt. And it scared her. And that was a surprise to her because she said, I don't know what to do with money. And she realized it was fear. As soon as she'd get her hands on money, she'd buy stuff immediately, get herself right back in the hole because she didn't know what to do. And when she saw that pattern, she said, it stops right here. She did the work we talked about. Okay, what do you do when you get money? What, what can you do to save the money and then invest it? And it's not rocket science. And as soon as she started to work on that slowly but surely, it changed. Everything changed. And as far as I know, she has not had another dollar of credit card debt since. So this stuff can be very, very powerful when you stop and think about it. So think about your parents and the way that you were raised. And are there any spillover effects or patterns showing up in your life? And it, you know, this is the sort of thing um, that can sneak up on you. You don't even realize it. So I'll just give you an example of that. Um, this fall, I did a research project where I spoke to it and I interviewed women coast to coast to coast in Canada. I spoke to 78 women and I talked to them about where do they feel confident when it comes to money and where do they not have any confidence? So, you know, what's their background? What do their parents do? What do their parents teach them? Where are they at today? And I was talking with one lady and we'll call her Shelly. Um, Shelly is retired and she is facing the loss of her home. She is in a very serious financial situation right now. And as we talked about this, I just took a little bit of time aside from the interview to ask a few questions. And she realized she had just lived her mom's life. Her mom went through exactly the same patterns and she broke down. This is a 70 something woman who was on the phone sobbing, realizing, oh my God, I have just lived my mom's life. And it was such a heartbreaking moment. But I turned that around and said, okay, now here's, so at least you have uncovered that pattern. Are you willing to choose different behaviors now? Because what happened is she was doing it unconsciously and she was. So I said, she said, but it's too late for me. And I was like, hold on a second. The average lifespan for a woman is, is greater than 85 right now. You, and I said, what about your family? She said, oh, my family will live until they're almost 100. I was like, great. You've got another 20 years. What can you accomplish? in about 20 years time. And she really perked up, but she had no idea because so much of this is unconscious. So do not underestimate the power of your beliefs and of the subconscious stuff that we bring to the table for money. You know, Susie Orman once said, money is not a money problem, it's a people problem. There's something about our patterns or behaviors that is causing us to act this way. And that's why I'm spending so much time right now because it is so important. So what do you do? Start thinking about it. So write a money journal, start a money journal. And if you're like, oh, I don't do journals, great. Just take a piece of paper, a post-it note, I don't care. And as stuff occurs to you, 
just write it down. This does not have to be poetry. You know, if you say to me, I can't write, I don't care, write stick figures, you know, draw pictures. But just think for a moment about how do you think about money? How do you talk about money? Um, and here's the thing, tell the truth. And we are so good at justifying our behaviors. We do it without even thinking. And we are doing ourselves such harm when we do that. So just tell the truth to yourself. You're not exposing this to anyone. You're just being honest about, oh, wow, I do do that. So here's what I'm going to ask you. Do me a favor. Um, just give me a, a green check mark. If you think right now, just from what I've been talking about, you can identify at least one money pattern, good or bad, in your life. Can you think of anything? All right, so we have quite a few check marks. As I said, it's worth, I'm not just talking about the bad patterns, I'm talking about the good patterns as well, because it's worth saying, this has served me well, and we're gonna feed on this when we talk about uh, the following steps, two through five. This will come up again and again and again, okay? So just hold on to that. and. What you want to do is you want to take your time and say, okay, so identify the pattern, first of all. And secondly, ask yourself, where is this coming from? Why do I do this? And don't expect for the heavens to open up and to have these great big revelations and to think, oh, well, there's the answer right there. It's not going to come in three seconds. It may take a while. Let it take a while. It might come as when you're in the shower or when you're peeling vegetables or when you're driving, you know, the kids off to an activity. It may come in the middle of mindless activity, but just sit with it and give it time. And then you can proceed to the other steps, but keep working at this until everything becomes deliberate and conscious. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah? Do we get any check marks or any happy faces there? Okay, great. So one of the things that I want to uh, point out before I move on is the importance of tackling only one thing because as women, you know, we are multitaskers galore. We just have 14 things on the go and we, we fool ourselves into thinking that we can do them all well. There's a ton of research to show us that you can't. You can only tackle one thing at a time. So this is not about beating yourself up and saying, oh God, I'm a failure. I can't do all of this. Forget it. You've got one thing. Tackle the biggest one, figure it out, and then move on to the next one. And what I want you to do is I want you to pay attention to procrastination because if ever there's procrastination, that is the biggest red flag that you've got. So procrastination is huge. If you find yourself procrastinating, don't beat yourself up. Don't call yourself names. That's not productive. Just sit and say, huh, isn't that interesting? And that was a lesson that a good friend taught me. She said, you know what, Doris, when bad stuff happens in my life, and she's one of these Zen people, it makes me crazy sometimes, but she's totally Zen. She just, you know, she said, huh, isn't that interesting? So I want you to do the same thing. If you're seeing yourself procrastinating and not getting to something you darn well know you should be doing, take a minute and just say, back to number four, why am I doing that? What's going on here? All right, does that make sense, everybody? Give me a brief check mark if that, if that makes sense. Excellent, okay. Um, so. Now that we've tackled the mindset, what I want to do is I'm going to move on to two things. So research has shown us that in order for new behaviors to stick, two things have to happen. One, we have to feel that it's doable. We have to think that, yep, we're capable of doing this. So with any behaviors that you have, I will tell you right now, you are capable of making different choices. The second thing that research tells us is for new behaviors to stick, it has to be worthwhile. And as women, you know, we put ourselves at the bottom of the list often. So we'll say, oh, yeah, I know that's important, but I've got to get to my husband, my kids, my everybody else, right? My work, and we're at the bottom of the list. So I'm going to say, okay, that's fine. We'll tackle that, that issue later. But for right now, why should you do this? Why should you take the time to figure out the money patterns? Because your kids are watching you. Your kids are learning from you. And if you don't think they are, I want you to think about this. In my research, the one that I just mentioned from this fall, the 78 women that I talked to, one of the questions I asked them is, talk to me, same things that I just asked you about your mindset right now. I just said, talk to me about your parents. What was it like growing up in your house? How did they talk about money? Um, and so they established all this information. So, oh, you know, my parents struggled with money and, you know, they never had enough or whatever the story was. Or, you know, they told me save, 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 and, and they were great savers. So whatever it was, interestingly, when I said, okay, so where are you at today? And they gave me their current situation. 
over and over and over again, I found the patterns of the parents was replicated in the women's lives. So that's why, you know what, and I said to these women, did you consciously do that? Of course they didn't, but I wanted to make that pattern conscious and deliberately, de deliberately um, available to them. So think about what your kids are seeing. Think about the way that you talk, the patterns that you're exhibiting. If you're not aware of them, your kids are going to be aware of them, consciously or otherwise, and they will show up in their lives. And if you're the world's best saver and investor, that is awesome. And you have a higher likelihood that your kids are going to be that way as well. But if there are some areas where you're thinking, oh, I really would rather my kids didn't uh, adopt that pattern, then it's time to say, okay, let's figure this out right now. So it's a total win-win. It's a win for you. It's a win for your family. It's a win for your kids. And this isn't about beating yourself up, uh, but it's also uh, worth thinking about that this is our responsibility. It may not be our fault. It certainly isn't our fault where we're at right now, the beliefs that we have but it is our responsibility. And that brings me to the second step, which is determine your goals. Now, everybody's talking about this. Everybody says, you know, you've got to have goals. You have to figure out where you're going. Here's what I want to, I want to ask you. So think back five years ago, 2013. Give me a smiley face if you can recall or if you had written goals back there. So go ahead and give me a smiley face. If you can think back to 2013, and you had five-year written goals. Anybody? I'm just gonna scroll up and down here. So I get one smiley face out of all the participants. And you know what? Don't beat yourself up because that is common. Everybody knows they should have goals. Everybody knows they should have written goals and yet pretty much nobody does it. Here's the thing about goals. How do you know if it's the right goal for your family, right? So it seems like such a, a, a big, big issue. So. If you had goals, so the one person who had goals, I'm just going to walk through this super quickly because what, never mind the goals, what were your priorities five years ago? You know, for the goals or your priorities that you set for yourself back then, have you accomplished them? And if you had goals, what criteria did you use to select those goals? So I want you to think about something here. So let's just park the whole uh, discussion about goals for a second. I want you to imagine that tomorrow morning, I'm going to give you a call. I'm going to go, hey, listen, I need you to do something for me. I need you to hop in your car and, and drive. So the first thing you're going to say to me is why, but let's just assume you accept my ridiculous request and you say, all right, Darius, I'm going to go hop in my car and you say, oh, where am I going? I was like, never mind that. Just go drive and drive as fast as you can go. And you think, well, I've lost my mind. That's absolutely absurd. You're like, look, I'm just going to go drive without knowing where I'm going. And yet, that's pretty much how we drive our finances when we do it without goals. We're hopping in our financial car, we're driving as fast as we possibly can, and then we are mystified about the destination when we get there, but we've not planned it in any way. And you know what? Somebody said to me just recently, they're like, you know what, there's, this is all nice here, this goal setting thing, but life throws wrenches in the way all the time. And I said, listen, I get that. I have the world's biggest wrench. That doesn't mean you don't set goals. It means you adapt because your goals are never going to be carried out nice and neatly, right? Number one, number two, number three, number four, number five. I don't know anybody for whom that's true. But if you have the goals, you at least set the course and the direction. But what is the thing about goals? How can you tell if it's the right goal for your family? If you're sitting there and you've got, you know, all sorts of possibilities for goals, how do you know where to start? This is such a big deal. I want you to think about goals differently. I, want, I don't want you to just sit down and try to dream up things that are important to you. Where do you start? Uh, yeah, if you had no goals, don't worry, don't worry about that because you're, you're part of the norm. But I want you to think about goals and saying that where you end up is in part due to where you're going, the intentions, and your, your attention, which is where you put your focus and your action. So here's, here's what I'm gonna suggest that you do. I'm gonna suggest that you take an approach that I learned about through Alan McDonald, who is the co-author of a really good little book, Your Blueprint for, your Blueprint for Financial Fitness, is called Progera System. In there, uh, I had a, a really great conversation with Anna Allen. He's a financial advisor. I was interviewing him as part of uh, research and path on investing, et cetera. And uh, he gave me a copy of his book, and I read that book. And in there, there's an absolutely brilliant approach 
that I had not seen before. And that just was an aha moment for me. It was transformational and it makes all of the difference. It's values-based planning and budgeting. Um, so most people, when they approach goal setting and when they approach budgeting, it's kind of an ad hoc thing. They're just kind of pulling things out. They're like, well, I know I need to, you know, pay, I need a roof over my head, et cetera, and then I need some food on the table. But after that, it's a bit of a free for all. So Alan talks about using, Alan and his, his co author, Paula Barge, talk about using your values to drive it all. So the way that you approach this now, so goals and, and, um, uh, uh, actions, uh, your values are all tied in. So what you're going to do is say, instead of just spending my money and saying, okay, I've got to pay for the mortgage. I've got to, uh, you know, I've got to uh, put some, some food on the table. I've got to maybe make sure that medically we're covered for our family. And then after that kind of a uh, little bit of an ad hoc approach, what we're going to do is we're going to say what really matters to you what are your values so what if now we create goals that are based on your values what if we create uh, a budgeting approach based on your values so what does that mean that means that first you figure out what are the top three to five things that matter most to you you use your values to drive your goals and your goals will then drive your action plan. And your action plan is very simply, what do you spend money on and how much money do you save? It basically drives all of the actions that follow from there. So here's what I'm gonna ask you. Think about what are the top three to five values that matter the most to you? I'll give you an example from my own life. When I sat down to do this exercise, this was very easy for me because of what I went through. So, you know, when you lose a husband at the age of 31, that makes health the number one priority in your life. So for me, my family's health is number one in my values. All of my spending, my goals, everything is to prioritize family health first and foremost. Secondly, it's financial security. You know, when you've been completely broke, $400,000 in debt, you realize that you have no options when you have no money. And that's the thing for me that was critical in all of this was to just say, I am never, ever going to be there again. So I make financial security one of my top priorities. So it's number two on my list. Number three is doing work that I love. Again, it goes back to losing my first husband, Malcolm, at 31. You know, that puts into perspective this whole notion that life is way too short to waste. So for me, that was a driving motivator. Number three, doing work I love, making sure that I would do this work for free, whether I got paid or not, I don't care. And it's true. I love this so much. I eat this stuff. When you talk to my friends, they know. I think about this all the time, how to help people, how to help women financially, how to create smart systems, things that work. This is work I love. And I'm never going to do anything differently because it's one of my key values. Number four is contribution, making sure that I make a difference in the planet, whether that's through charitable giving or doing work that makes a difference in people's life. That is a main motivator for me, making sure that I do something that makes a difference at the end and then learning through travel. And the reason I share this with you is because when we have those, we establish those, that then drove what are the goals for my family. Now, what I want you to think about for you is you need to ensure that you and your spouse are on the same page. So here's what I want. Give me a green check mark if you and your spouse have ever differed on a subject, whether it's how to spend money or you know the, the goals that you have. So go ahead and give me a green check mark if you and your spouse, if there's ever been a difference between where you wanted to go and where he wanted to go. All right, wow. You know what? So there are a lot of people on there, but some of you don't have green check marks, so good for you. I think that's, that's awesome. If you've always been on the same page with your husband, I have not. Um, so there have been some moments where uh, my husband Mark and I have you know, differed quite significantly in what we wanted, but our core values are very similar. So I made my list, he made his list, they're not, ident they're not identical, but the things that matter the most are the things that we focus on. So we sat down and that's very important. So do this activity 
yourself and then get your spouse to do it and take some time to sit down and say, all right, what matters to our family? Because that's going to drive the spending. The spending choices flow from there. So you start, you figure out your values, you've got your top three to five values, and then you say, okay, based on that, based on these things that are the most important for us, what are the goals that we have as a family? So, so again, I'll just use my example. For us, our family's health. So in there, make and financial security. So financial security for me means never having corrosive debt. So we set up our goals to make sure that that never happens. We set up uh, for our family's health to make sure that we're setting aside money for activities that are going to enhance our health. That's critically important for us. So what you do is you say, okay, these are the values that, that are driving the goals and the goals from there. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, here are all the things that we could spend money on, right? And you start checking off the ones that are say, what are the most important given our values and given our goals? And that's how you make your spending choices. Because a lot of people otherwise are just saying, well, I've got the hockey lessons, I've got the dance lessons, we've got the trip to so-and-so, we've got the renovation. How do you decide where to spend your money on? A lot of people say, well, they don't decide, they just go into debt. And we'll talk about debt in a minute. Um, but debt is not, is not congruent with any of the values or corrosive debt is not congruent. Uh, well, actually, I'll just bring that up uh, in a second right now. So corrosive debt. My definition of that is debt that impoverishes you. So there's some debt. So you buy, you, uh, buy an investment property. I'm a real estate investor. Uh, and I became an investor early on. So I did real estate and then more recently the stock market. So I do have mortgages and those are for assets that put money in my pocket. I'm okay with that debt. Corrosive debt is debt that takes money out of your pocket. And there's nothing better to do that than credit card debt. And in fact, there's an interesting thing that the banks, when they first created these cards, they called them credit cards. Sounds very noble, right? To have credit. Really what these cards are, are debt cards. Because every dime you put on those cards, and we use them as a tool, my husband and I, and we get lots of points for that, but we don't carry a balance because at 18 to 24%, it creates a hole faster than you can get out of it if you're not careful, and certainly if you're making minimum payments. So one of the things I want you to think about is when you're looking at where does our family spend its money, Pay attention to the values and start choosing based on what matters most to your family. And then when you get to the end of the line, so let's say you've got $5,000 a month after tax to spend, you start with your values. Maybe the value is making sure you've got a roof over your head. So you set aside the money for the mortgage and the rent. And then after that, you say uh, health, making sure we've got some good food on the table, making sure that we've got some good activities for the kids and for ourselves as well. So back roof check mark. And then you work your way through your values and at some point you get to the end of that $5,000 and you're done. That is it. So everything below there gets dropped off because sure, it may be fun or matter, but it doesn't matter as much based on your values. The choice for a lot of people is to say, but I still want those things. And so that's where they tack on the debt. And I just want you to bring that back up to a deliberate conscious choice of saying, if you do that, that is not congruent with your values and goals, because debt is destructive. So think about this. I'm going to leave you with one question. Um, every dollar has a purpose. So when you're spending your money, ask, is this getting me closer to my goals or is this getting me farther away from my goals? And if we make our spending deliberate and conscious, that goes a long way to helping us get to the goals that we want and making sure that those goals and those actions are consistent with our values. Does that make sense? So give me a, a green check mark if that makes sense or give me uh, the red X if that's, that's a little bit opaque or if that doesn't make sense. We got some green check marks. Okay, great. All right, so we're gonna leave this here and say, okay, right, so we've established some goals based on our values. So we talked about goals first, but really we're figuring out the values. We've established goals. Where do we go to from here? So from here, we go to financial protection. I wrote this book, Protect Your Purse, Shared Lessons for Women, Avoid Financial Messes, Stop Emotional Bankruptcies, and Take Charge of Your Money. And that's a mouthful, but so was my experience. Um, I wrote that book and launched it last May based on my experience and that of 38 other women that I interviewed. They were divorcees and they were widows. They're women who have experienced loss. So here's what I wanted to know. 
I saw through my work with clients, a lot of people who've been in financial difficulty, a lot of people who end up in some really difficult spots, just like I did. And I wanted to know what happens here? How do people get there? Is it because people aren't smart enough? And I realized, you yeah, know, nope, that's not it at all because I'm reasonably smart and every single one of the women that I interviewed, super smart ladies. So I thought, okay, is it about education? Nope, again, I have eight years of post-secondary education. I had scholarships throughout all of my university career. The women that I talked to, highly successful, accomplished women as well. That's not it. What happens is that we just get busy responding to the fires in our life, right? So there's this pressure at, at work. So we gotta take care of that. And then, oh my God, the kids have to go skating on Wednesday and they need skates and, and it's Tuesday. And then you realize, oh, I've got to do this, I've got to do that. And then we get busy in the to-do list and we don't think about what's happening in our lives. So I call this looking at the trees. We're stuck looking at a tree in front of us. We don't even realize what forest we're in. So my book got written to take a step back and go, ladies, we need to think about some things here. We need to set some stuff in place to protect ourselves. So this book goes into a lot of detail. It tells the full story of my, uh, my full story what happened, how I found myself $400,000 in debt. It talks about how I got out of debt in two years' time. And it tells uh, the story as well as those 38 other women. It shares our advice and our biggest lessons learned. But what I want to share with you today is two of the top pieces of advice that I give in that book. And it's all about protecting yourself. So document and talk. So we'll talk about the talk in a minute. This for women is something that comes a little bit more naturally. Uh, but the first thing is key documents. You know, this is where I get a little bit grumpy at times. Um, and, you know, I, I bring out my mom voice because the research shows us that very few people have up-to-date valid wills. And uh, I'm going to let you in on a secret. I'm going to share four key points in this key document section here. And I'm just going to tell you ahead of time, I had none of them in place when Malcolm died. And it, it caused devastation, it caused uh, heartache, just an insane amount of stress. And all of this stuff could have been done and put in place before and saved so much heartache. And I, I do a lot of presentations, I do a lot of speaking to groups. Um, and I talk to women and I say, hey, do you have this in place? And I know from my conversations that a lot of women go, oh, God, I've been meaning to get to that. You know, I, we have a will, I think, or I can't locate it. It was done 10 years ago. And I'm going to be a little bit stern here. And I'm going to say that there is no excuse. There is no good excuse for not having a valid up-to-date will um, because it is the thing if death happens, and, and a lot of people think that they're pretty bulletproof. They're like, you know what, Doris, I'm, God, we're so healthy in our marriage. We're young, we're fit, we're healthy. I cannot tell you the number of emails I get from women who are in their 20s, 30s, early 40s, who have lost their spouse, or from men who have lost their wives. Young age, accident, illness, no good reason. I had a 39-year-old friend who lost her 39-year-old husband. He exhibited signs of the flu on Friday, was dead by Wednesday. And it was a long story. It was the perfect storm of three god-awful things and, and something that got missed uh, by a doctor. But the bottom line is 39 years old, and she is a widow with two young children. And thankfully, she had a will in place. But if you don't, it's just so awful for your family to deal with it. So here are a couple of things. People think about wills and they go, yep, yeah, yeah, I'm going to get that done. Do it. Put that first on your list. We're going to talk about a financial date night with your husband. That will be the first thing to do is to say, do we have, have valid up-to-date wills? And there's a great service. So for a lot of people, they say, I just don't have the money to spend on a will. It's going to be four, five, six hundred dollars $600. I do recommend talking to a lawyer, but if you you do not have the resources for that. There's a great service, legalwills.ca in Canada, .com in the U.S. They've got a U.S. version. They've got a U.K. version. You can go on there, and I think it costs $40 or something. And I did a comparison. I know I, I reached out to the president of that company and did a comparison with my legal lawyer done up uh, will 
than his version and it was virtually identical. So for simple situations, if you have a mixed family where you've remarried and there are some kids, that's a little bit complicated, I really urge you to talk to a lawyer. But two things you need to talk about on that will is what to do with the kids in the event that you both die or that something happens to incapacitate both of you. Because if you don't, guess what? The state decides what's gonna happen to your kids. No mother, no father on the planet wants that. So take the time to do that. And your assets, because think about this. So we have rental properties. Any assets you have, anything you own, imagine that. I, and this is unpleasant. And dealing with wills, the whole question of wills, I get that. It's not fun, right? It's 0% fun. But it's so important to do it. Do it, get it in place, and then put it away, right? Stop thinking about it because now your plan B is in place. But so I want you to think about right now. Imagine that your spouse is gone tomorrow morning knock on wood, they're healthy, may they be there for 100 years. However, for the purpose of this exercise, gone tomorrow. What do you do with all of this stuff in your life, right? Do you know what to do with your house? Do you know where all of your accounts are? Do you know where all of that information is? Do you know what you do with it? We have rental properties. What would my husband do with the rental properties? I have created a document that says, here are all the properties, because he doesn't deal with any of that, I do. So here are all of our properties. Here's the ones that you're gonna sell. Here's the ones that you're going to keep. Here's who you're going to talk to from our property management company, et cetera. So that's one example. But go through your own life and say, all of this stuff here for the kids as well, right? Because imagine that something happened to you. Do me a favor. Put, give me a green check mark if you think your husband, because I see that it's, I think, pretty much all women. Let me just double check here. I think it's all women on the line right now. Give me a green check mark if you think your husband would know 100% what to do with the kids, their activities, their lunches, their, you know, get, go ahead and give me a, a green check mark if you think that your husband would know exactly what to do if you were to disappear tomorrow. Okay, so we've got, we've got a couple of check marks, but not very many, right? So I'm not, I'm not trying to uh, demean men, by the way. The same thing would, would, would hold true if he were to disappear and you now have to handle everything that he handles. So the point is, are they prepared? The more information you put down in that document, the better it is. This is about kindness and loving for the people who are left behind. I didn't have that. And you know what? It was my own fault because I didn't put it into place. I was so busy dealing with life as it was happening. So I just, I don't want you to have to go through that. So please tell me that you're going to take care of that right away if you have not. Sufficient life insurance policy. This is another thing. A lot of people think that life insurance is just to cover the mortgage uh, and a couple of other things. Let me tell you the first thing about dying. It's not cheap. It is very expensive to deal with death, even if you go the inexpensive route as I did with Malcolm. So you're gonna be spending anywhere from five to $10,000 right out of the gate just to deal with the death. And that's not even any of the other stuff. What about taking time off just so that you can deal with the trauma of loss? What about uh, you know, figuring out how are you gonna help your kids? Maybe your kids are gonna have a hard time with the loss. It's about thinking about all of those details and putting that into place. This is not the place to cheap out folks. You've got lots of places in your life where you can cut corners and say, you know, we can, we can scale down on that side of things. This is not the place to do it. So talk to an advisor about proper coverage, look at some numbers and then think very carefully. This is an investment in your future in the event that something happens. View it that way, not as a loss. I'm telling you it changes the game. Listing all of the assets, so we talked about that. So a lot of people reach out to me, they know that I was widowed, and when it happens to them, they say, listen, can you help my friend? She's just going through this right now. And what happens so often is that they haven't the faintest idea where to start. They haven't the faintest idea what they've got because she takes care of one set of things and he takes care of another set of things. So a key document to have is just a list of everything that you own, all of your assets, and that includes the bank accounts, the investments, anything else like that, and liabilities, the loans, the debts, the money you owe grandma, whatever it is, put that on the list. And it doesn't have to be fancy. It can just be a sheet of paper where you've got all of this stuff down. I'd rather see that you've got a post-it notes. Gosh, get a collection of post-it notes if need be. But just put it down somewhere and then keep it somewhere where you know where you can find it. Agree that you're going to put it in a file folder or a filing cabinet or somewhere that makes sense to you where if something happens, that's the go-to place. You know exactly where to go so the perfect can check in. I'll tell you something. You know, 
as smart as you may be, when you're dealing with loss, with trauma, I swear to God, like three quarters of your IQ drops and it disappears for the longest time. It was so hard for me to even function basically. For the first three weeks after the loss of my husband, I sat on the floor crying. I went into the grocery store at one point knowing I needed to eat, but I couldn't eat. And my father-in-law said, you need to eat something. So I went to the grocery store and I'm walking through the aisles and I'm looking at rows of cans and packages and none of it makes sense. I was overwhelmed. Can you imagine that? Somebody was working on her doctoral thesis, going through a grocery store, not able to figure out what are the cans, what do I, I just abandoned the cart. I went running out of the grocery store in tears. I couldn't figure it out because my brain was hijacked by trauma and by emotion. That's just to give you an idea of what it's like. So it's work. The more information you can put into place, and I'm not saying this is going to happen. Just because you do this doesn't mean it's going to happen. It's just a preventative measure. And the final thing is passwords to all accounts devices. So go ahead and give me a smiley face if you know how to get into your spouse's uh, smartphone and computer. Let's just see how many smiley faces we get. Okay. Oh, awesome. Okay, this is great. So a lot of you, that's fantastic. That is really important because as I said, I did not have that information when Malcolm died. I couldn't get into his computer. His computer had a ton of information uh, that we needed about financing and, and some of the financial aspects of our life. That was in his computer now. Thank God. This was a long time ago. This was 18 years ago. But thank God back then I had a computer genius for a friend who was able to hack into the computer. Computers have become much more sophisticated now, so that would be a lot more difficult to put off or, or to pull off. So, do yourself a favor, and if you don't have a list of the passwords for all of the devices, that's something that's super simple and that you can put into place right now. So, okay, enough of that stuff. So, key documents, and this is about protection. This is just about putting together that information there and saying, what would we do if, right? And then you've got it in place, now you breathe easily because you say, okay, we're protected. Nothing is going to protect you from that list in the event of divorce. That's a whole other conversation. Um, and I'm happy if you have some questions about that, fire me off an email, I'm happy to answer them. This stuff here won't, won't protect you in the event of divorce, but there are other steps that you can take. This is the kind of stuff, the heart-stopping stuff, that if something tragic happens, you at least have a first order protection that you can move forward, all right? So now, I think I'm the only uh, financial writer who says, who recommends that you have a night to drink some wine with your husband, and this is so important. And no, it's not about romance. This is about talking about money. So what I want to share with you uh, is some more results from the research that I did. So the 78 ladies that I talked to, one of the things I did is I said, okay, uh, talk to me about how you deal with finances in your family. Who does what? And how often do you talk about things? And you know what's interesting? Nobody talks about money. They talk about money in passing. They, hey, listen, did you pay for? Or yeah, I covered the, you know, and it's just two ships passing in the night and that's it. That's exactly the full and extent of the conversation. I'm going to suggest that in order to protect yourself and in order to thrive financially, you need to be on the same page and you need to communicate. You know, relationships are all about communication. Well, guess what? Finances, when it comes to the relationship, are core as well. It is one of the biggest reasons that people split up, the whole money issue. So the way to avert that on the negative side, but on the positive side to ensure that you reach all those really cool, cool values-based goals that you put into place is to have a regular date night. Now, what do I mean about regular date night? I'm talking about a night where you do not have any kids around you. So you have a babysitter. Uh, ideally, you need privacy to talk about money and you may have to pull out some of your documents. So get somebody to take the kids out to a movie or get somebody to you know, take the kids off to a different part of the house or have a sleepover, whatever it takes for you to have privacy with your spouse to sit down and, you know, wine, tea, coffee, whatever, I don't care. It's just the sitting down to talk about where are we at? What's happening in our lives? Where are we going? Uh, or even just familiarize yourself with where you're at financially. How much are we paying for hydro, by the way? Um, how much is the car insurance? And for ladies, this is where it's important to talk about investing. So in my research, 
I asked women to rate themselves on a scale of one to 10 for how confident they felt. And we talked about uh, managing money. Ladies are great at managing money. They feel very, very confident when it comes to managing money. Making money. Most women feel reasonably confident when it comes to knowing how to make good money. Investing. Very few women know how to invest. And here's what happens. Here's what they say to me. They say, oh, you know what? My husband takes care of that. So here's what I want to know. So go ahead and give me a smiley face. If you're the go-to person in your family for investments, if you're the one making the decisions and, uh, and executing on investments, so go ahead and give me a smiley face uh, if you're the one who does that. I'm looking for smiley faces. I don't see any smiley faces. Oh, I see two smiley faces. Okay, we got a few. All right, well, that's entirely consistent with my research. So there are a few women who do this, but it's certainly not the norm. So what happens as women is we lack self-confidence when it comes to that. And it's so important to be familiar with what's going on and to just say, all right, how does this work? What have we got, first of all, and how does this work? And I get a lot of women who say to me, God, Doris, that is so boring. I cannot stand it. Do you know, in part, I used to think exactly the same way, to think this is so mind-numbing. I started with real estate because I could not conceive of being interested uh, in the stock market. Or in other forms of investing, I now invest in second mortgages and first mortgages, et cetera. But regardless, any investments, the more you learn, the more interesting it gets. It's all about knowledge, right? It's all about taking away that barrier, that layer of fear. And starting with your spouse is the best place and say, what is that? How does that work? And guess what you might find out? You might find out he doesn't know either, right? Which is not uncommon. So men feel way more confident and they don't have any more knowledge usually than women do. And that's come out of a ton of research. We'll talk about that in a second. So the first thing is a regular date night. So how frequently? You know what? Just make it regular. So my husband and I do it. We try to aim for twice a month, but at the minimum once a month. A lot of people say, oh, we'll do it once a quarter or, or twice a year. That's not often enough. It is not often enough to stay on top of what's going on financially. And here's what you do. If you just review some of your basic goals during that time, you have a far greater likelihood of actually accomplishing them because now you've brought it up to the level of deliberate consciousness, right? You're making deliberate actions and you're aware. Awareness is key for financial success. All right. So does that make sense, everybody? Give me a green check mark if that makes sense or give me an X if you're like, nope, I don't get that. All right, perfect. All right, so we're gonna move on to the final uh, category now, the final step. Um, and these steps, by the way, so how did I choose these steps to share with you? Because there are many more, but these are the top five that I've seen in a decade of working with people and in my research of the areas where people are the weakest financially, where there's less time spent on making sure you get this right. And it's almost like the foundation of a house. You can build the prettiest house you want, you can put nice little curtains in there, put some nice furniture, but if the foundation isn't solid, you are in trouble. And what we're doing now is we're building out the financial foundation from which everything else grows. So the final one is prioritize saving and growing. So I'm going to step out. I know that I've, I've asked you to figure out what are the top three to five values for yourself. I'm going to strongly recommend that you prioritize saving and growing money. And by growing, I mean investing. So here's some concerning stats that came out. The number that just came out recently is significantly higher than it was even just two years ago. So it came out that uh, the banks have been doing uh, studies and there are a number of agencies that have been doing studies as well to see what's the level of indebtedness the banks are doing it because they're concerned about people's ability to pay their mortgages in the changing climate right now with interest rates, et cetera. So, what we've learned is that the average Canadian has $1.67 in debt for every dollar of income. If you think about that, people say, oh, well, you know, that's because of, of mortgages. So certainly mortgages are a significant part of that. And that, that can be a problem too. People think owning a home is a great answer. It's a great asset. It can be, but it is not always. It does not always make sense. And in fact, for people who are in the military, Here's what I would think about. So I've talked to a number of people who have uh, had postings, two, three year postings in one place, bought a house, bought a house somewhere else and lost money because three years is not a lot of time in a real estate cycle. A typical real estate cycle is about seven years. That's not enough time usually for appreciation unless you're in certain, certain 
very strong markets, but it's not enough time for appreciation to cover all of the costs that are involved in buying a house, and particularly if you're doing improvements to the house, et cetera. So I cannot tell you how many military people I know who have lost money in the transactions. Give me a, a green check mark if you know of people who have lost money, military people, because of a move, because of a move having to buy or sell a house. Right, there are, so I see an awful lot of check marks. That's consistent with my information as well. So you know what, owning a house isn't always an asset. So what I want you to think about is just the level of indebtedness as a whole. And let's not make any assumptions about good debt versus bad debt. Good, people say this all the time, they're like, oh, is it good debt or is it bad debt? Hold on a second. Good debt is not true for everybody. It goes back to your values and your goals, right? And your current situation, if you're in the military, it may not make sense to buy a house. So I just want to put that out there that there's this pervasive thought that somehow home ownership is this great investment. It is not always. I have lost money on investments because the market has tanked and now you're stuck with a house that's not cash flowing, it's worth a fraction and you lose money. So just be careful with that and don't make assumptions about what's good debt, what's bad debt. But so going back to the level of indebtedness right now, at $1.67 for every dollar of money saved, that tells us a couple of things. The level of debt has gone up and the level of savings have gone down and that's borne out by the research as well. Saving is a necessary step. It's a first step, but it's not enough. So if I say prioritize savings, I mean, we need to start thinking about how can we reduce the debt, eliminate the corrosive debt, and start saving more. And people say, oh yeah, I save money, I save money. And that is awesome. But here's another thing that came up from my research. So the women who were really good at saving did that. And then they didn't know what to do with it. But they thought, I've saved all this money and I've put it in GICs, so I'm good, it's invested. The thing about GICs is right now, the GICs are not even returning percentage to cover inflation. So GICs, if you get 1%, you're lucky right now, unless you lock it in for a very long time. Inflation is sitting at roughly 2%, just under 2%. So that means that any money you have locked up in GICs is losing buying power over the time that it's in there, right? So that may make sense as you're nearing retirement. I don't, I'm not here to lock GICs, but I am here to say that what we assume are safe investments are not necessarily. It depends on our values, our priorities, our goals, and where we happen to be. So saving is that first step, and, and, but from there, we need to build wealth. So why do we need to build wealth? That's another word that comes really loaded with all sorts of emotion. People go, oh, I, I don't like the concept of wealth because of the people I associate with that. There's an amazing book by Mariko Lin Chang, and she studied what's going on with women financially. So, you know, she, why is it that women don't invest as much, et cetera? And as part of that research, she looked at what matters? What are, the, what are the key factors that play the biggest role in making sure that women are financially resilient? And she found, we think that a high income is the cat's meow. That's the thing that's gonna protect us. And listen, a high income is fantastic. I will tell you from my experience working with clients, that what I saw an awful lot is the higher the income, the bigger the hole that people managed to dig for themselves because they had behaviors that did not support their goals and their values. They just basically said, oh, I've got more money to spend. So they spent more money, right? So you basically inflated the lifestyle as the inflated the income. Income is not the answer. And that's supported by Chang's uh, research. She showed that having wealth is a greater indicator of financial resilience than a high income. And that's true. You can find people who have very modest incomes who manage to, to pack away and to grow their money into really nice little, little nests for themselves. And you know what that does? That gives you options. Good or bad, whatever life throws at you, you have options. So the good, you can decide, do I want to go to Mexico for my holidays? Or like my family, we just got back from Australia. Do we want to go to Australia? It gives you the option in the good times. And in the bad times, when life throws a holy smoke situation at you, you have options now to say, oh, okay, what are we going to do? Well, we can do this, or we have the money, we can do that. It gives you options. And that, for me, if I could give a gift to every single woman I know, it would be the gift of having, having strong, good, viable options, regardless of what life throws your way. 
So to do that, you need some wealth. All right, so how do you get to wealth? Well, investing is the key. So in my research, the, I, I could see immediately that investing is the area where women feel the least confident. And when I say least confident, it's not just a little, a little bit uh, unconfident. It's like, so I asked women to rate themselves out of 10. I said, how confident do you feel in the following areas? And when I said about investing and growing your money, I gave them a one to 10 scale. I said, 10 is you're a rock star. You are awesome. You know how to do this. You got this. One is you don't feel very confident at all. Do you know how many zeros I got? I got a lot of zeros and one woman flipped at me. She said, can I give you a negative number? Because that's how, that's how insecure she felt about it. And Chang's research shows us that as women, we are very conservative. And that actually stands us in good favor. That stands us in good stead because we're careful with our money. We, we want to make sure that we have it to protect our families. However, the other thing is that the, the flip side of that is that we are scared to take chances with it. We are scared to invest it because we feel that if we lose it, it's gone and it's gone forever. There's this feeling of the scarcity about it. And we were chatting a little bit, Joanna and a few other ladies uh, before this all started about our lack of self-confidence and it comes from education. So I'm here to tell you today, I mean, in a short presentation like this, I can't do it very, very, I, I can't go into a ton of detail, but I'm here to tell you this is not rocket science. And there's a great book that I see Joanna has highlighted, which is the smartest investment book you'll ever read by Dan Zolan. Now, Dan's a great guy. This is a short book. And if you're rolling your eyes going, oh my God, Doris, I do not want to read an investment book. Let me tell you something. It's a short book. It's actually written in English and it makes sense. It talks to you about what to do and what not to do. It takes a critical look at the financial advice industry and it tells you what really matters. There are some key factors that really matter. Is it the most sophisticated book? Nope. Is it a great starting point? Absolutely. It is enough to get you going. It is enough for you to feel that, okay, I can do this. It's the best starter book that I can find. Bottom line, and so investing, I just, just above where Joanna highlighted the smartest investment book, uh, I put Warren Buffett recommends low cost index funds. So one of the things that Dan points out in his book is invest in something as simple as low cost index funds. Start there. Index funds are just a basket that represent the market, right? And they can be a basket of stocks or equities. It can be a basket of uh, bonds. So it's just baskets. Think of it that way. And low cost is critical. Do you know how important these index funds are? Warren Buffett, I was stunned when I read an article. Do you know the advice he's given to his wife? Do you know how, how successful, how sophisticated Warren Buffett is? Do you think he'd have a massive team of people? showing his wife exactly what to do when he departs this earth, what to do with their investments. And he basically has one piece of advice, put it all in low cost index funds. So you know what, if Warren Buffett is saying that to his wife, probably not bad advice. So one of the things I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish up this presentation here by just saying the things that you think matter, don't. A lot of people say to me, but Doris, I can't invest because I don't know how to pick stocks. Well, the good news is there is a ton of research by academics who don't have anything to gain from this research, and that's so important in this industry because a lot of people who write stuff have stuff to gain. They have a vested interest in the information they're putting out there. Well, these are academics who are doing pure economic research, and it shows that choosing uh, stocks, stock picking, is not effective. It is not a winning game. So you don't have to pick stocks. All right. The second thing is the number one factor that will influence how well your portfolio does is cost. Now, this is where Dan's book is excellent. He goes into a lot of detail about that and he shows you just what's going on in the cost. A lot of people think 1% is nothing. 1% can translate into hundreds of thousands of dollars by the time you retire. And that money can either go into your pocket or it can go into the fund's pocket or it can go into your advisor's pocket. So fees are critical. And I'm not here to knock financial advisors, but I am here to strike a word of caution about that industry because a lot of people who are giving advice right now have something to gain from the funds that they recommend. 
my own advisor, so I know how to do this stuff and I have an advisor, so I do think there's a ton of merit to getting good, solid advice. I do it, first of all, because I'm going to focus on something else. And also, this, my advisor, that's all he does. He focuses, he's an expert in that. However, he has nothing to gain. So none, any of the funds that he recommends for us, basically he does not get a kickback. He's not paid by those funds. And I just want to say in passing, anybody who tells you they're giving you free advice, they are not working for free. They are being paid usually by the funds that they are recommending to you. So be careful about that. Try to separate out and find people who do not have a vested interest if you are going to use an advisor. Advisors, their biggest, their biggest advantage, their biggest role is to stop us from doing really stupid stuff. So we all know that we should buy when prices are low and sell when prices are high. But what happens? We buy when prices are high because we get all excited and there's the hot stock, right? You should never touch the hot stock because now you're paying a premium for it. And then we panic when we see the values go down and we sell. It's like shooting yourself in the foot. So that's where advisors come in. They basically help you to kind of stay the course, figure out what your goals are and say, nope, we're not going to sell. When all the values are tumbling, guess what we're going to do? What would you do if the price of, of something you really wanted, like a price of boots or something you've been, you've been eyeing or some expensive coat, and all of a sudden it drops by half, you would haul yourself out there and say, I had been intending to buy this and now it's half price. I'm going to buy it and save all that money, right? So it's the same thing for stocks, but we don't do that. So there is value to financial advice, but just be careful. Read Solon's book and understand that it cost is important, very, very important, and then just balancing it out. Index funds are your friend. You can start there and then optimize as you go along and as you learn more. So I want to leave you finally with one thing, which is women must participate in this. It is time to do that kicking and screaming. I'll just give you an example. So I've got a, a set of friends here in Ottawa, and he loves to invest. He loves everything about it. He reads, in fact, he gave me kind of a doorstopper of a book to read uh, about investing. She hates it. She can't think of anything more tedious. So they took my advice and they started a date night. And they started talking and she came up to me recently and she said, you know what, I can't believe I'm going to admit this, but it's actually starting to make sense. So they sit down, they crack open a bottle of wine and they talk about their money and he has slowly and surely been helping her see what he's doing and the investments and it's starting to make sense to her. So I just want you to be kind and gentle with yourself, but I do want you to do this. So don't let yourself off the hook and say, I don't have time. These are all excuses that we say to mask the fact that we are fearful. I get what it's like to have a million balls in the air. I totally understand that. Um, but this is so important. It's important to help protect you and it's important to help set you up for the future. So I'm gonna do a super quick recap right now. What have we talked about in this last hour and a bit? So we have talked about money patterns and stories. Start at the beginning, figure out why you're doing what you're doing, figure out what's going on in your life right now, what patterns can you observe, and then make a conscious decision to set down a behaviors that will support you, that will be congruent with your goals. Two, determine your most important values. So what matters to you above all? That's gonna drive everything else. Stop and think and sit down and have a chat with your spouse, if you have a spouse or your partner, to just say, are we on the same page? What really matters for our family? Establish those priorities. Three, create your goals based on those values. So you, if, if health is important, you know, or I'll give you an example of this. So if you say, spending time with my family, that's goal number one. Um, Alan McDonald, the co-author that I talked to you about uh, earlier of, uh, of the financial blueprint, he told me a story, he said two of his clients are realtors, and they said their number one goal was spending time with their kids, and yet these two people work seven days, and they said without a hint of irony, they work seven days a week, 12 hours a day. They have missed anniversaries, they've missed birthdays, they've missed family gatherings, and yet they say that spending time with family is their number one value. So I think the point of this is to say, are my actions congruent with what I claim are my values? Are my goals congruent with what I claim are my values? So that's the real value of that. Number four, create regular date nights with your spouse. And you know what? It is so easy to put this off because you get busy and say, I don't have time. So I'm going to challenge you to pull out your calendar today and just 
put down the date and put it in writing and find a babysitter. And you know what? You will thank yourself five years from now. In fact, I would love for you to put in your calendar five years from now, send Doris an email and let me know, here's where I was at on January, what is it today? 8th, 9th, 9th, uh, 2018. And where am I at January 9, 2023? And I can tell you that if you just do that one thing, sitting having regular date nights with your spouse, you are going to find yourself so much further ahead than if you hadn't done that. And then finally, number five, make growing your money a priority, saving and growing your money. And notice I don't just say saving, I say growing because it's about investing. So investing is something that is not uh, number one on any woman's list that I know. But it is something that for the women who've actually tackled it, not you don't have to become you don't have to become an advisor, but who've just tackled it in their lives, they are in a much more secure position. They've created greater wealth for themselves. And who benefits from that wealth? Everybody does. There's a brilliant book, Three Cups of Tea, by Greg Mortensen, and he is built or has been building for years now schools in Afghanistan and Pakistan, and he's been building schools specifically for girls. And when he was interviewed. People ask them, they're like, well, what about the boys? And he said, here's what I've noticed. If you interview girls, if you, if you educate the boys, the boys have access to education, not all of them, but more than girls. He said, the boys take that education and, and they go lead their lives, they go off. If you educate the girls, they stay and they transform their communities. And it is my contention that if we help women build their wealth, and we're seeing that already, there's some really great data coming out already, they stay and they transform their communities. And that's what I hope to achieve is just greater options, greater stability for women, and just leave you at a point where, you know what, whatever life happens, you're good. So right now, uh, that's the end of my presentation. I'm gonna open it up to some questions if people have questions. Um, I'm just gonna say the report from my research project, Women and Money, uh, perceived strengths and weaknesses is only available to my mailing list. So if you want a copy of that, just basically fire me off an email, ask to be added to my mailing list, and I'll shoot you off a copy of that. Uh, if you want to learn more about, you know, my writing, I have uh, courses on investing and, and financial foundations. Some of that's on my website, some of that's through my mailing list. So you can see me there on Facebook, Twitter, blog, whatever it is. If you have any specific questions that you'd like to fire away at me, please do. My email's on there as well. So I'm just going to turn this back over to Joanna and take any questions. If you like. Thank you so much, Doris. Um, I actually am going to start with a question. It, it didn't really specifically get asked in the chat, but it sort of was out there. I think for those of us here who are impacted by the military lifestyle um, mm -hmm. in some way, in particular if we are in a military family that gets moved a lot. Mm -hmm. All of this sounds, it sounds so good and it's challenging and it's, and it's inspiring and we want to do it. But at the same hand, I think we tend to get very overwhelmed by these frequent moves. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so I just, this is sort of an altruistic answer I'm looking for, I suppose, but you know, if you were speaking just to us on that level of, you know, when you talk about finding the job you love, I know someone said that's so hard when you move every two years mm -hmm. and maybe you're a nurse, but you can't work in this province or, you know, right. or a teacher or, you know, whatever that, you know, whatever that is, it's hard to build a career. It's, um, yeah. man, we want to, we want to own a home so bad. It's not, mm -hmm. we can't, we're not, a lot, we're not able to because we're moving in two sure. years. And so what? Just sort of starting, like where would you say for that person who, who hears all this and they're like, yes, like I love this all, I want to do this, but I feel like our military lifestyle really puts me at a disadvantage. Just where, what would your just like general statement to that be? So I completely understand and agree that if you're moving every two or three years, there is an inherent disadvantage in that. So I get that. So that's part of the lemons that life throws at you. But you know what? For every lemon that you get, there's lemonade to be made. So I'm, I'm a big fan of lemonade. And, you know, you don't always get the ideal circumstances. So I would just say that when I talked about one of my values, my number three value is doing work that I love. So I get it. So let's use your example. You said a nurse, right? Um, if you're a nurse uh, and you cannot work either because they don't recognize the same, well, first of all, you're there for two or three years. So it, it's very difficult to get a job. What I would say is you might not be able to do what you have been trained to do, but guess what? Neither am I. I was trained to be a neurolinguist. 
So I retrained myself to do something different. Um, basically what I say is find something that you love to do and try to continue to build your skills. So whatever skills are relevant to your work, whether those be people skills or financial skills or technical skills, if you're an engineer or you know whatever work you're in, you can continue to read. You can belong to organizations. There's a lot of stuff that's available online. This is, is one of those online mechanisms where you can continue to learn what the women who are on this call today, you are building your skills, continue to do this sort of thing. So yeah, it might not be skills in the specific area where you've trained, but just continue to build your skills. Uh, something that, first of all, you enjoy, and that will benefit you down the road. So you might not be able to take full advantage of it right now, but it's something like down the road. So I would just say, keep a finger in there, you know, connect with other women, either in your industry, uh, online, locally, do whatever you can. You know, we are insanely creative people, all of us. I talk to so many women who say, I'm really not creative, and that's baloney. We are all super creative when we give ourselves a chance to be. So what I would do is if I were traveling around every two or three years, I would just say, huh, okay. So I cannot practice this job being a nurse. What can I do? Is there some way that maybe I can volunteer so that I can keep up my skills? Is there some way that I can be hired? And I realize for visas, et cetera, it's not always possible, but I'm just exploring options here, right? So I would just say, is there some work that I could be doing that is at least prolifer uh, um, slightly related to what I was doing, peripherally, there's the word that I was looking for, um, and still get paid or do something where you have a sense, you feel a sense of value, both for yourself and sharing your skills. So find something that you love, get involved in something that you love, reach out and understand that's not, I get that that may not come easily to people. It doesn't come easily to me. A lot of people think that I'm this big extroverted person, but there's a huge part of me that's an introvert. When we go out to parties and I don't know anybody, do you know who is Mr. Personality is my husband? He's the one who's out talking to everybody. And meanwhile, I just look at it in my corner and I have to force myself to come and say, hi, how are you? So I understand that this means leave your comfort zone. But here's what I've learned over everything that I've been through. The minute you leave your comfort zone, you are growing. The minute you leave your comfort zone, you are building new skills. That is always valuable. And finally, I would say to your point about the home where people desperately want to buy a home and they can't because of the current military lifestyle. I get that. So here's the challenge that I would do. So you're probably not buying a home because you're moving every two or three years. Live as if. Live as if you have a home and you're paying a mortgage and put the money that you have in the mortgage or, or some difference into a fund that is growing and that's your home fund. So yeah, you may not be able to buy a home now, but you will later on. And if you start behaving as if you are a homeowner, the money you would spend for repairs. So my good friend who is in Washington is uh, renting a place right now. So I just said, hey, you're not spending anything on repairs. So when you go off for, when, when somebody's doing something where they're repairing, you know, they would be repairing the house, whatever they spent, put that money aside and that goes into your pot or whatever. Now they, they own a home here in Canada, but if you don't, you know what I'm saying? Like, does this make sense? Yeah, where you, absolutely. You, you, take a, you take a look and you say, what would I be spending if I owned a home right now? And yet you're still spending money right now because you're probably renting a place somewhere, but it's the over and above. Because when you rent, you don't pay any of the costs usually of repairing the place. So take those repairs, take the additional rent, if, or the additional money you would pay for a mortgage, if that's the case, set it aside, grow that, and call that fund my home. Right? So you've got that as this overriding goal, because if you say it's super important to these people as part of their values, then start attributing money to that, because when you start saying, how am I spending my money, if that's a big value for your family, that's where you should be parking some of your money. That's that great. Sense? And yeah, absolutely. And I basically, it sounds, you know, and this is a good reminder for everyone, um, it don't look at the negatives, but find the solutions. So. Well, I'm just going to say, don't look at the negative. I'm not Pollyanna. I don't believe in not spending any time. I think there's something to be learned from the negative, right? 
Um, and that's part and parcel of saying what are our current patterns and behaviors right now. So I'm not someone who says, don't la, 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 let's not look at the negative. <laughs> right. Look at the negative, but understand, put it into perspective. Right. And understand you're in a negative, but are you gaining something from that? Because presumably this is a choice that the family has made, right? So if the family has made that choice, then there's something being gained from that. What's being gained? So look appreciate the positive that's coming out of there and say, okay, so, but this bit here, that's still lemons, right? So yeah, we made a choice the family, but that still sucks. Um, and so how can I use this to my greater advantage? And I would say that the reason I'm where I'm at today is because of the lemons that have come into my life, not the lemonade. So the lemons are an opportunity for us to grow more than we ever thought we could. So don't underestimate the value of the stuff that sucks in your life. Awesome. Anybody else have any questions for Doris? And don't forget her contact information is on the left-hand side. Yeah, Sandra. I have a few, so I'll start with, I just wanted to keep elaborate on corrosive debt and give some examples. So corrosive debt, is the debt that takes money out of your pocket at an alarming rate. So for example, um, credit card debt. So I talked about the fact that uh, they're called credit cards. I think that's a misnomer. They should really be called debt cards because if every time we pulled it out and used it and we said, I'm, I choose to use my debt card to incur debt right now. Um, and for those of us who pay it off all the time, that basically means that it's short-term debt. So you don't pay any interest because you're paying it off on time. But for a lot of people, that debt stays there and they make not the full payment. So anytime you carry a balance on your card, you are paying 18 to 24% uh, interest on any balance remaining. And then you're, they're tacking on the interest on top of that. So it's an ever growing hold. So when you do the math on a, a balance owing, so if you take a thousand dollars, for example, on a credit card, um, and you don't make any payments. So this is this is a theoretical thing, and we're we're going to I'll, I'll change that to making just minimum payments. If you don't make any payments, that debt will double in four years' time. Think about how powerful that is, and how much you're paying. So that's corrosive. That's going to chew away at your wealth. Even if you make the minimum payments, you're still going to double the amount that you owe in a, a ridiculous amount of time. So to me, any credit card debt is corrosive simply because of the onerous interest rates that you're paying. So people say to me, all right, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna consolidate that. And I'm gonna put that under a line of credit and that's going to be so much better. Okay, so yes, it is better than paying, so presuming, of course, that the, the uh, consolidated loan or the line of credit is now at a lower interest rate. So if you're paying three, five, six, seven, eight percent on your line of credit, that is definitely better than 18%. But the way that I want people to start thinking about their money is to look at everything they have in their lives and to say, what's putting money into my jeans and what's taking money out of my jeans? And when you start to do that, you start to realize, okay, so my mortgage is taking money out of my jeans. And people argue, they'll say, yeah, but it's going to put money in your jeans later on when you sell. Yes and no, depending on the value of the house. So that's a whole other conversation. But if you're going to live there and be there for many years, probably a, a good investment, assuming you can easily afford that. But now let's take a look at lines of credit for other stuff. So lines of credit take money out of your jeans. So my question is, what did you pay for with that line of credit? What's it for? If it's for a new sofa, uh, you know, or, or other consumer goods, probably not worth it. So corrosive simply means, does it get you closer to your goals or further away from your goals? Does it take money out of your pocket or put money back into your pocket. Uh, if the whole, if, so if you're familiar with Robert Kiyosaki, he's the one who first, uh, he's the rich dad, the author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Um, he's the one who first familiarized this whole thing of, of an asset is something that puts money in your pocket, a liability is something that takes it out. I just want people to start thinking about what they have, what they owe, and why it's there. So if you have borrowed money to create a greater good. So maybe you've had to buy a car and finance that, but not a super expensive car, to get you to a job that pays you significantly more money. So that, you could look at that and say, okay, so that, yes, it's debt, but it's not corrosive because it's allowing me to earn more money. Corrosive debt simply is that money that you've paid 
that continues to cost you and is not giving you any reward back for that, any financial or value-driven reward. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks. And then we just had a couple of little comments like um, your car or a car loan or we have a truck loan. Yeah. Yeah, well, truck loan, so, you know, trucks and cars, those are, those are a dicey thing because sometimes they're absolutely necessary to get yourself to and from. I'll tell you something, though. My husband and I used to have two vehicles, and we went down to one, and it does cause challenges, but we looked at that. His work, so he's a consultant. He flies out. He's, he's, uh, his travel doesn't require a car. It requires flying a lot of the time. Um, and we said, you know what? What if we sold one of our vehicles? and didn't have that, and we immediately saved $5,000 a year because of the insurance, because of all the maintenance, et cetera. Um, and we said, every once in a while, if we need to, we will just use a taxi without any guilt or without any, any issue. And we saved a whack of money. So my question is always just about bringing all of the decisions back up to the conscious, deliberate level and saying, okay, so this new truck loan, what's it doing for our family? Is it necessary? And is that the level of vehicle necessary and if you can easily afford it and you're saving you're investing you've got all your value driven uh spending taken care of then do what you want you know enjoy the enjoy the truck loan you're good but if there's if there's some some competition for the dollars at play then that's where you have to start saying okay so let's think about this and it may be that it is the wisest choice for the family uh, but all i want is for people to ask those questions that makes sense yeah, thank you. So we're it, we, we're at an hour and a half. So I'm going to take Amanda as our last question. Um, but again, remember everyone on the on the slide here in front of you, you can see Doris's email. Plus, when you leave today's session, you are going to be auto directed to uh, Doris's web page too, where you can find her contact information as well. So Amanda, um, just feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay, thank you. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, I sure can. Great. Um, okay, so my question is about TFSAs. Um, I, I have some money in a TFSA that I put there because uh, the potential was we were going to be buying a second house, which it turns Now my question is, should I be using a TFSA as a retirement vehicle, or is that a bad idea? What do you think? So I can't answer specific questions like that without knowing a whole lot more, because a TFSA uses after-tax dollars, right? So you pay tax on your dollars, and now you're putting it into a vehicle where it will grow tax-free, which is Yahoo awesome. Um, but depending on how you earn your income, it may make more sense to put it in our RFP. Is it worth investing? Is my answer, 100% always, yes, absolutely invest. But people talk about TFSA like that's the investment. I just want people to understand that TFSA is just, it's the basket, right? You put something into a basket, but what have you put in that basket? So inside that TFSA, you can have stocks, you can have funds, you can have bonds, you can have all sorts of things in there. So my question, my response to you is, first of all, take a look at your earnings. And if you have an accountant, chat with an accountant about what's the smartest use of my dollars. Should we put the pre-tax dollars into RSPs if we max those out? Or if you've maxed out your RSPs, then 100% max out your TFSAs. It is a, a very powerful vehicle. Now, I just want to, full disclosure, I don't use TFSAs because we keep everything in our corporation and are doing stuff in our corporation. The uh, Canadian government may be changing that with legislation that's on the table right now, uh, but it's a very individual uh, thing to decide what makes sense for our family. So probably max out the RSPs if you have a salary that is not, you know, you're not a company, and it's, it's fully taxed, probably makes sense to max out the RSPs. And then after that, max out the TFSAs. But understand that when you're putting stuff in your TFSAs, you're putting them in a basket. And now my question is, what are you investing in inside that TFSA? And that's where I strongly recommend Daniel Solon's books to start thinking about, huh, what am I going to do? Am I going to go pick stocks? Am I going to, and I hope after this presentation, you're going to go, oh, wait a minute, I don't think that's a great idea. Um, so, or am I going to go invest in index funds or bonds or what am I going to do? So, I think TFSAs are a great vehicle, but again, it's going to depend on where you're at. Just be careful, though, to, to understand that putting it into the TFSA is just step number one. you got to figure out, what am I going to do inside that TFSA? Yep. Thank you. All right. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Doris, uh, for bringing your experience and your information to us. Um, I've already got one of those books that you recommended on my Amazon ready to buy. Like, so <laughs> I, uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Again, everyone, if you uh, want to get a hold of her, just check out her email there on the slide or you're going to be auto-directed at the end. So thank you all for coming and you're free to go. Just close out the session by clicking on the X in the upper right hand corner. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.